actually what you showed off previously, that image was the research before this. So I was trying to create uh, okay, put it this way. There's this mandala ritual, you know, and personally I'm not Buddhist. Uh, but in Buddhism, they have this practice where you have a picture of the universe in the Buddhism world. So it has like uh, different gods in the image and then it has a very geometric shape. What they do is they use the colorful sand to draw the mandala as a way of meditating. And the reason why it can be a message, my own interpretation is the physicality because they have this tool and they're using the sand and they have to remember the image. So they are not referring to another image, they have to remember it by mind to draw it. And they have to they have this tool like this shape with the sand in there where they have to touch it like this. So the sand will fall onto the pictures like pigments. And I like that kind of practice in the sense that the physicality leads you into another status that you'll be thinking But the problem is that I'm not Buddhist and that image doesn't apply to me at all. Uh, to be honest, uh, my life's been trained. So in Taiwan we have the separation since high school. You either choose the uh, social sciences or you choose the natural sciences direction. And I choose the natural sciences direction because I always thought that I'm going to be a scientist when I was young. So I think my uh, system of values are actually constructed on the science system. And in a way, you can also say that science is a belief. But it's just a, a belief that's a bit more logical, but still, like, it's not, it's not completely the truth. Like, the science is not the truth. In the process of science, a lot of time is actually what you believe. So I want to sort of change that into a practice that will apply to me, but I also have a physicality. So that's why I start this. Uh, the pressure dish becomes an image. Uh, we are on this system where it's very like um, baby life uh, tools. So you can actually see it over here. And what I do is I try to first use one petri dish to sample uh, bacteria, like in the one in the center, from the soil. And what I find interesting with the idea of the universe is that the universe has a lot of species living in there. And they have, well, they're like an ecosystem. And I was looking for a small ecosystem that I just like to with. So the, sand, uh, the soil becomes a good option because there are a lot of microbes in there. So I try to sample it in the very beginning, the first pressure bit. After a while, you have different color uh, microbes going in there with different visions. And then try to separate them on the second ring and the third ring using different colors uh, of the agar. Also to select them. And then use them as pigments. I built this uh, machine, it's a modified 3D printing machine. Uh, using 3D is because like, what we know, this special dish is really hard to adjust the height. So it also needs that. I can I use a uh, inject printer to do it. And then I use the isolated bacteria as my ink and try to print an image that's actually a borrow from the string theory. So in string theory, it's completely a belief in a way. Like a lot of scientists think that it's not even real science. It's more like the ideology of how the physics will want the world constructed. And the idea of that is that this universe is very, very geometrical symmetry. So all the particles are corresponding to each other. So I use that imagery, uh, image to be a 2D uh, projection on the petri dish. Use the machine to program to print it. But the machine is also taking my brainwave. So the brainwave device will read and interpret if I'm meditating or not. Even though it's not really like I was check checking if they can really tell uh, that we are meditating or not. But it turns out that nobody knows what that company was using the algorithm to decide who is meditating. 
So this is more like the process of me adjusting myself to the machine that I let the machine read that I'm meditating. It doesn't really matter if I'm really meditating or not, but making myself compatible to it. And if it doesn't, like if the value fluctuates a bit, I'll have an image that's not so symmetric because some of them won't print out too well. So this is one of the prints, and also the first one will be the other print. And it becomes like practice, like usually the expression will go on for like a month. And uh, yeah, you see all the plates up there, even though maybe not so obvious here. So, uh, here? You mean the expression? No, it was in Taiwan. And it was for a whole month. So every, uh, every day I'll go there to inoculate the bacteria, separate them, and every week I'll do one print. So this was one print. And uh, this was the other one, which I had the sample from different places. So you can also see the construction of this very different. Uh, so this is from this one. And it's like, it's like a way of reorganizing the universe that I see. Because you also always use our own way of understanding the world to understand and to categorize things. So what you see here is like you couldn't really see the red dots. They are very small. But once I use them as big ones, they become more obvious. It's like a manipulated universe where they are trying to graph for different nutrients in there and trying to become their own um, small ecosystem that's balanced more. So that's my, uh, I think that's my more um, complete work that's related with bacteria and fungus. Another, another route that I'm going is the uh, topics of viruses. And I'm really interested in viruses in the sense that um, viruses are not exactly alive. So in the scientific definition, they're uh, said to be not living because they cannot replicate themselves. But at the same time, we have a lot of, um, a lot of viral gene in our body. And also at the same time, they can cause huge changes to the human world. Like for example, smallpox has been killed uh, has killed 90% of the Aboriginals, well, the Native Americans in this, uh, America, the whole America. So uh, some people were saying that the reason why the Europeans can really control their land is because of the disease instead of anything else. And um, this is controlling everything, influencing the history as well. So the first project, this was the around 2011 to 2012, was trying to see how um, we can serve. Okay, so I was studying in relative art in design directions. So I have a start that's more speculative design, which so I have a different uh, a possible future scenario. So for this scenario, we're suggesting that perhaps uh, people will have will have a uh, vaccination all the time, like how we have the anti-vaccine, uh, sorry, antivirus software. So we can use so they update occasionally. But the research start with this um, whole presentation: human and smallpox. So I have I have a book. And the book is printed in layers with um, transparent paper. And uh, also the, the lines you see underneath is the genetic code of smallpox. And the whole book has a map as well. We can see how the viruses travel with humans to different places. And the history of, um, of human and uh, vaccines, actually, because smallpox was also the first one that got the vaccines. Uh, what happens is they have some really interesting stories when researching it. Like, for example, uh, even though in the science world they claim that it's the British who invented the uh, vaccination, but similar methods of vaccination. Uh, it's been practiced for like a few hundred years in China and India, it's been recorded, also in Korea. So, 
It was first like people were using the weaker strains of smallpox and to be inoculated into either through the clothes or blow it into your nose so you can have the pus from the skin of a sick person who recovers and then you can blow it into a healthy person so the person will actually become sick but not die and once they are sick they won't catch the dangerous one anymore and one of the emperor Qianlong uh, in China got his throne that one of the rumor is that because he got the smallpox he already survived so it's okay that he will like he, he will survive the disease and he won't die so there's less risk so he can get thrown. Yeah. And there's also different practice uh, in the palace when there's an outbreak, there's a certain procedure that where they dispose the corpse from inside of the palace to outside that people are not allowed to watch it. Or, you know, like as a ritual, usually if it's a royal, we have a very big funeral. They have a special regulation that you can only go certain rooms so you don't spread the disease. And then I have this um, map of how the smallpox travel around the world with human first out from Africa and then to different places of the world. And actually that's the scientific research people have done by looking at the genetic code of smallpox that sample different places in the world and backtracking their uh, family tree in a way. And just, uh, what to when they went to certain places. So after that, uh, more historical research, I have this fictional company that's called Vaccine Beauty. So I was thinking, okay, if actually there were around that time, there were a lot of researchers saying that uh, they're anticipating more and more um, uh, what's that called? infectious disease to happen. Uh, and for one of the people was suggesting that they don't know why that happens. It might be just the natural speed and tempo of the evolution. And then some other were suggesting that is because the uh, connection, transportation connection of the world and the change of the climate. So uh, animals are moving in different places and humans are also moving in different places. So that brings the uh, infectious disease to places that they, are, they have never been to. So that increases the speed of uh, the disease. And I was thinking if that happens and push it in the future, would we have a society that's always like, really afraid of disease? Like, for example, you might remember a few years ago it was first SARS, and then it was the Ebola, and then it was the MERS. So all of them was really scary. And right now we have a sort of outbreak because people are like, taking vaccines in Europe for missiles for kids. So all this kind of happening. I'm thinking, well, what happens in Taiwan, we have the SARS outbreak, is people start to be really afraid of the distance with a, for, uh, with a foreign person. Like the foreign says that it's a person that I don't know. And if the person is like coughing or <laughs> looks sick, then you'll be super afraid of that person, even though you don't know what. If they got a disease or not. And uh, I'm thinking maybe then there's a way to show that I'm safe. Like showing I have the newest vaccination. So this company, fictional company, actually produced these things as a beauty product but as a vaccine at the same time. So by applying that product on your skin, you will get the vaccination and also the coat. So the dots on the forehead is the coat and shows which version they have. And they can put it in more uh, public places or more secret places so you can have to be friends with people. So this guy on the left hand side happened to be the poor guy who cannot afford the newest vaccination all the time, he can only get the second hand. So he is always vulnerable to different diseases. Uh, another scenario is he got a different treatment in the pub because he doesn't have the newest object. Uh, he has always to be afraid of eating food because he might get the um, like a sick like that. And there's this thick model of um, this vaccine beauty company that produces different grades of vaccines. So the first vaccine is that you get updates like almost every month or every week. And then the next one, 
uh, I don't have a picture here, but the next one you'll be getting it less frequently. And then there is also the biohack community, which is trying to come up with their own best things that you can apply for yourself. But you have to, um, you have to be responsible for yourself. But then sort of break you out from the actual um, system of economy that sort of then make you be like. I think the disease and the economic system is always corresponding to each other. Like if you are poor, you cannot afford the better health care. And without the social system, then you are like doomed to be putting at a lower level for everything because of the disease. But the thing is, disease won't choose the person because you are rich or not. So I quite like that kind of idea. And then uh, have another project which is also around disease because somehow the past project has a lot of things that couldn't quite like it doesn't feel quite right, it doesn't really talk about the thing that I really want to talk about. And then I fortunately got the the thing called Bad Award, which is Bio Art and Design Award, and it's uh, a fun thing in the Netherlands and it allows you to collaborate with a scientist. So I got funding where my collaborator is a scientist in Rotterdam in the Erasmus Medical Center. She studies norovirus particularly. And we came up with this project which is called Tame is to Tame. We want to try to push it a little bit more, suggesting that actually uh, let's ignore about the economical system, but more like how we as human uh, bring involve us into the system of evolution with the viruses. So we can avoid um, being sort of evolutionary backwards. Like because in a way you can say that people are not evolving anymore because of the medical system and um, because what our attitude towards the medical system or our attitude towards the disease is that we always want to call back them. But it's problematic. So I was just uh, think that actually for all these dangerous things, they are not completely harmful for us and we can sort of uh, try to tame them like how human tame the dog uh, tame the wolves and become the dogs. So the beginning reason was also because of smallpox. So the problem with smallpox is that it's been eradicated and it's like achievement of humankind. Um, but the problem is we don't have the vaccination of smallpox anymore. Like the younger generation doesn't receive the vaccination, while the virus is still somewhere in the world. In the labs, like uh, I think they have a few in the states. In a few labs, they have it, and then they might also have some in Russia and maybe in some other countries as well. And there was like a few years ago, there was this uh, uh, well potential outbreak because someone was handling the smallpox in the wrong way in the state, so they were afraid that the virus would see. So actually eradicating them is not the best way. If you can have the viruses that uh, infect people the best or like spread themselves the best, it's actually the one that doesn't kill them much. Like for example, cold, common cold, everybody gets common cold, it's spreading everywhere. But you won't be killed. If you got killed, then you cannot be the transmitter of the viruses anymore. So the best strategy for the virus is actually being not so harmful for the host. So we have this manifesto of uh, the virus tamers and it says that as human we should rethink about our way of treating viruses in the sense that we should find a way to co-live with them, cohabit with them. And one of the few important things that we need to think about are we um, are they using us as their host or are we just their habitat? So playing with all this idea like how much do we frame them in work to readjust our attitude. And after readjusting the attitude, we can choose to become two kinds of tamers. One kind is the virus hugger, which always wants to approach the viruses and healthy enough to get infected by viruses and get the immunity. And the other one is the one that can uh, try to have a distance with the viruses but always handle them in a very extremely safe way but extremely trained. Uh, one of the reasons why we were proposing that is the norovirus the scientists were studying 
um, cannot produce vaccines yet. And the reason why we cannot have vaccines for the norovirus is that we cannot have a non-human host to replicate the virus. So we cannot replicate, uh, replicate them outside of our body, so we cannot come up with a vaccine for it. So for those, we have to be more aware how do we live with them. And so we draw our blood, and uh, these are two profiles, one is mine, the other is the scientist. We draw our blood to use their equipment to check our immunity with the norovirus. And to see if, so what affects is that first is your blood type. The blood type will influence how vulnerable you are to different types of noroviruses. Because when viruses trying to enter the cells, to infect the cells, it needs a scepter, a receptor. And different blood type means that you have different uh, receptors on the uh, membrane of the cell. So which ones would be the... Well, it depends. It depends which subtype of norovirus that is and which blood type you have. So it's always like it has a different combination. And so this uh, one type O, but there's also other kind of uh, entities of the cells. So you can see one of the, um, I'm, I'm vulnerable to certain types that the scientist doesn't. So we have this idea of if I have this different type, I can move differently in the city. If I know what kind of outbreak it is in the city. So, for example, if I know I'm more about to uh, to like one, which is a subtype, and she is more, um, she is less likely to get it. If there's an outbreak in the city center of Amsterdam, she can go there and help the people there, or to deliver a package or anything, just going in and out, and she won't carry the disease and won't spread it. Well, I should be away from it. Or I should directly go and get the disease, make sure that I recover, and make sure that I get immunity and not dropping viruses anymore. And then I can do those jobs to maintain the functionality of the city. So right now we have a city that people don't really look into the disease part to uh, modify daily behavior. But in the world of the tamers, tamers will um, <coughs> function differently every day according to the landscape viruses. And uh, for the tamers, if you are the virus hugger that you want to get an immunity through getting sick, because norovirus is something that makes you pregnant right. diarrhea, and when you have that, it's really painful. And when it lasts about 12 hours, and you feel like you're dying, you see everything in your life is like, I have, I'm, this is the last day of my life. But after that, you're okay. So there's the team for the tamers to be mentally prepared for that. The tea actually makes you pew and puke and diarrhea. So you can practice this ritual every year and to remind yourself that it's okay psychologically that your body can endure that kind of stress. That's if you want, or you can just directly confront with the disease. So this is the exercise for the tamers because to be aware when you have the contact with the viruses and when you are spreading the viruses is a very different physicality than we are normally. So this exercise helps you to practice. Like for example, you practice your hands so you can uh, handle objects better in more detail. There is the exercise for the shoulder which allows you to cough and do other things when like when you cough you should do this. But for most of the people it's really hard so and that stretch this part. Also, most of the time, your hands are like this. Because if you have your hands like this, you don't touch whatever. And without uh, unconsciously touching and touching your mouth, so you will spread this kind of disease. And then there's also a part that's borrowed from the Chinese medicine that if you rotate your spine, that sort of increase your immunity. That's also sort of an exercise that you circulate your blood. So it's a physical exercise, but also um, um, regular.
isolates your physicality, physical movements, so you will be more aware of what you have touched and what you haven't touched. And uh, yeah, like this is moving the shoulder. So there are six movements in total. <laughs> basically in a high risk space. So try to implement all that physicality into these movements. And then after that, so there are six movements in total. It's really funny, like I have this video in this vision and some people actually practice with it. <laughs> I like what happens. And then we also had um, the physical studies of movement. So this is more looking at from the more free dance perspective to see how your physicality would change and your mind would change. And she has this object which helps her to open more sophisticated objects, like putting on the gloves, still not using the hands, and then using the hands only for handling this kind of thing. Like open the door. Yeah, and then try to use it as a structure for experimenting. Yeah. So the, uh, the objects you are using it in there, uh, it's actually a reference of how people practice Chinese martial arts. Like some of the martial arts to practice the movements, also like um, boxing, you also have one thing that you practice with that all the time, so you can practice your physicality to have your body accommodate to that. So um, for the tamers, they have these things where they can practice with it every day without actually uh, going out just to a door or keep doing strange things. They are more special. And then there's the board game because I really want people to get into that mindset. So I had this uh, board game which we got the data from the real patient um, because it's a medical, medical school basically and they have patients with data with their immunity so you can role play in the data with actual patients of course no name with their blood type with their immunity and trying to modulate live with different type of noroviruses on the board in different space so they can it's a collaborative work and all the people can discuss how will we, uh, how fast should we get rid of a disease, like an outbreak, or how slow should we let it also transmit a bit, so we can also get the, um, we can also get the immunity to deal with the next outbreak. And there are certain locations on the map, like schools, kindergarten, or uh, old people's houses that are more vulnerable, so they are the ones that should get less, uh, should be attempted to get less con um, what's that called? infection because they are more vulnerable, but there are some other places that are safer. So people use this game to discuss the strategy to cope with the viruses. So that was uh, the project, and um, the mission. So, so it was planned to be a hit. Uh, pet quarter, and you can go in there seeing the logos and the space and look at the 
all the different objects like it's a trending head culture and then you can practice it there. Where was this exhibition? Um, it was in different places like it was in Netherlands, in Taiwan. Yeah. So now it comes to what sort of very late with this workshop. I'm writing a cookbook right now using viruses because after doing taming, I want to sort of in a way it gets more crazy, but in a way it gets more down to earth at the same time, uh, by looking at how we can use viruses in the future. And the interesting thing is, first I went to the virologist that's in the medicine, and of course they treat the viruses like it's always causing disease. But then I approach plant virologists and marine biologists. What they say is that they think at the moment, even though we are far from discovering all the viruses. They are speculating about 90% of the viruses are beneficial to us instead of harmful. And the reason why we know most of the harmful ones is because that is decided by what we are looking for. So the scientific funding system really consists of you have to write a grant and say how much contribution this research can, to, can do to the human community. And that means usually if you are combating a disease, then you get more grants. But for the general research, the ecological research, they don't really get much money. But then that also affects that we have 90% of viruses that we don't know and very likely to be beneficial for us. I was also looking at the history of how bacteria um, or microbiology develops. So in microbiology, if you look how like it was developed around 18th century, 19th century ish, that people start to know there's bacteria, which now we start to know bacteria are actually beneficial for us and we are using it like the one the probiotics that we're growing. For viruses, the discovery of viruses starts around the end of 19th century and the beginning of 20th century. And back then, they were only looking for what caused disease. And it's not only until now, recently, people are using viruses for treating diseases. And also discovering that, for example, some plant viruses can make plants more vulnerable to drought, uh, to different, giving them new functionalities, and actually also changing the sensorial experience of other animals. Like, for example, there are plant viruses that attract, uh, makes the plant attracts the insects and the insects will come to the plant, um, suck the juice, but infected by the virus and then their preference changes. They will start to prefer the uninfected plants. That means the viruses are making the insects prefer to go to some clean plants that doesn't, is not sick yet to spread the disease. So their preference of food changes. I thought all this slide is really interesting. Uh, maybe we will start to use these virological um, elements in cooking as well and also extending our cooking experiences. So I have a book that has different categories. The first category actually is a part that I took from the previous project which is simulating the viral experiences, like how will we understand what sickness is in a dinner manual. So this is a, a simulation of novel viruses and consists of the first one is um, an oyster, like an oyster with a caviar that has everything that will make you feel chill and pukey. So once you eat it, because the oysters are usually the ones that transmit norovirus because they can concentrate the norovirus, and you can eat it to experience that sickness. And then also with the crunchy leaves, salad, with castor oil, which castor oil also makes your stomach more runny in that sense. And then with a tuna sashimi, with an electrical simulation on your abdomen. So you can like electrify your abdomen, so you can have the contraction, so you can know the physicality of it. And start with the raspberry sorbet. So the raspberry sorbet doesn't really make you sick, but raspberry is also something that transmits norovirus all the time and it's called after all this like, intense menu. 
you're probably going to feel sick as well after eating this. <laughs> so that's is simulating the physical experiences through food. And then I come to the second chapter, which is using viruses for fermentation. Um, one of the examples um, that I have start with the norovirus. And I was thinking because viruses can change the uh, structure of tissues as well. So it can also be a way of fermenting things. But they have to ferment the things when they are alive. So I have the example here, which is a way of neural fermentation in the farm. Um, norovirus can make your intestine become more smooth. You lose the pilies, which is like the hair on the um, intestine. And as Taiwanese, we have dishes that you eat the intestines of animals. And uh, so I see them as a potential preferable new texture of food material which this farm only takes requests. They count on how many um, how many intestines they have to produce every week to back trade when they have to inoculate the cows with the disease. So it's a weakened norovirus that they don't spread to human and it only focus on making the cow's diarrhea and uh, it's really cool but the more I write it the more I think it's really close to the farming methods sometimes we have so they inoculate the viruses to the cows and the cows will have their own immune system but it takes a while for them to get rid of the disease so they have to time it make sure that the cows are infected by the viruses a week in advance and then by the end of the week they will kill the animal and then inoculate the next patch of cows for the disease and they will produce those intestines. Uh, they might also um, think referring to the cows more clean because they already have get rid of everything. There's nothing that left in their intestine. So that's one of the really cruel uh, direction that was going on. The more I write, the more scary it is. And those using the viruses as active ingredients and that builds sort of on the idea of vaccination. So uh, you can directionally evolve the viruses or uh, genetic engineer the viruses that they don't they don't cause that much of sickness and then you can still get the vaccination. Um, also, I was thinking that if they become an active ingredient like paper that we use in the food, they can expand the sensorial experience that we have in the food. So one of the examples if is the influenza balut. The reference is actually come from, so right now in the industry of growing uh, influenza vaccines is that they grow in the eggs, chicken eggs. So the chicken eggs has embryos in there already, and then you inject the viruses in the egg, and so the viruses will replicate using the embryo, and you extract the things in the egg after two or three days, and you use that as the vaccine. But then that also means kills the chicken. So this dish is actually, well, so balut is a traditional, I think Malaysian or Vietnamese dish that they eat the embryo of the duck. Yeah. Mm. yeah. It's crunchy. Yeah, and then when you open it, you can see the um, feathers and the face. So you get served an egg with a... Yeah, and you yeah. open it and you have it. Yeah, you see the dead chicken. Yeah, you boil the whole egg. And then how I, like, do I eat the thing with it? So actually, in I don't know about Netherlands, but like if I go to um, a shop that sells this in Taiwan, you can get the embryos. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. Mm. Really? Have you ever tried it? No, in front of my good friend tried okay. for his first and for his uh, gift. <laughs> <laughs> So I was sort of thinking, like, how can you reuse it? But also using eating as a way of vaccinating as well. Uh, so that's using them as an active ingredient because 
if the influenza virus is getting into your body, usually it affects the throat and you have fever. So this is suggesting that if you use these highly controlled viruses on the body that only you say induces fever for an hour or half a day, then you can have extended dining experience that's not just happening in the mouth, but also in the whole body. I mean, the interesting thing is, this now sounds obviously disgusting, but I don't know how other vaccinations are made. They're probably also like lab yeah. grown on rats or on mice or like, so we just don't see it, but we just get like a, a short thing and yeah. that's it. Yeah. But like, that's, and the research yeah. is really cruel because, um, so basically I have a background in life science for my bachelor degree. And we had a microbiology lab um, training. One of the training that we did was to inject the um, uh, influenza viruses into the eggs. So I still remember the experience of holding a warm egg where you can feel sort of the things mm -hmm. that's alive in there. And then you have to push another thing into it mm -hmm. and make it sick. So I was like really confused by that experience because we we're doing it for the experiment and then the bird is always being disposed somewhere else mm -hmm. and not used. And then they were also talking about uh, how they grow. So to have the eggs, you have to have the mother chicken in the, um, I don't know the English, but maybe minus pressure. So you have a chamber that they grow the chicken and the air only comes outwards never inward, so the chickens will never be uh, affected, in, uh, infected by any disease. So you can make sure that they are clean, and the eggs they produce are also clean, not infected. So then you can have all this production, and you can buy the eggs from those suppliers to do the experience in the lab, because it's not from the normal farm. The normal farm is too complicated, you might get contaminations in that sense. So I was always thinking like, oh, this undercover scientific research procedures, how can they be transformed into our daily life? And that's one of, that's why one of the dishes is like this. Now I'll show you the other one a bit later. Uh, that's also this part of it. <coughs> but then I want to uh, see a marine biologist up in the, what's that called? NIOC, which is the Marine Research Center in the North Netherlands. And she was talking about the sort of all amazing stories about viruses in the sea. And um, what happens is the viruses play an important role in the ocean because it helps the circulation of the nutrients. Because if all the animals get the nutrients and they uh, they will sort of she was using this reference of sandwich like Suppose in a whole system, the sea is an enclosed system, or the whole earth is an enclosed system. You only have this much of nutrients, say a hundred sandwich. And then the hundred sandwich will be able to feed certain species. But once the sandwich is being taken, then there's nothing else, unless you produce more sandwich from someone, something, some of the nutrients. So the viruses kill things, and that allows the recirculation of the nutrients. So the algae, on the surface, doing photosynthesis will be killed by the viruses where the nutrient can fall down to the bottom of the ocean so the nutrient can recirculate a bit. And uh, also there's the characteristic of viruses that can, uh, that can af make them effective at a different time. Like some are faster, some are slower. Some kill things faster and some slower and some gives other animals, new functionalities like they can transfer, for example, the gene of photosynthesis from one species to another. And so I was thinking about this idea of soup. Like in cuisines, we have a lot of soup. Uh, we can use like something that changed throughout time, controlling using viruses. So we have the temporal cocktail. That's one of the recipe, um, which you can um, so what I have here is the kombucha. The kombucha has a very complicated microbe system. If you kill certain microbes, then it changes the taste. I was also checking of uh, this, what's the smell of the death of yeast. And some people were saying it's a meaty smell. So uh, the strategy of, of these microorganisms 
very often said if they got infected by the viruses, they will kill themselves. In the sense that so the virus doesn't spread to the others. And so this culture is a small ecosystem. And you can drink it, so you can have a fest with people drinking for an hour or two hours, where you put the viruses in there, and the viruses will kill in different things at a different time. So throughout time, what you drink with the kombucha will change its taste. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's using the viruses as a cooking material. You just add it in, but it has a temporal uh, changes to the dish. And then the fifth category of cooking Oh yeah, and also I had a time frame for all these different categories. I was anticipating that we can do the simulation of disease like now. And then after five to ten years we can do the active uh, the fermentation part. And then maybe twenty to thirty years then we can have the uh, active ingredient part. And the dynamic control might be also around the same time, but a bit later. And then by around uh, 2065, we can rethink about what is cooking and to create this so-called ecosystem cuisine, which when you, like, if you look at the ecosystem, it's a system of eating and being eaten. So the chefs of ecosystem cuisine are challenged to make a dinner for everybody within the ecosystem. And then the uh, menu is designed by seeing, like, for the, uh, for example, the death of human means a lot to human, but the death of algae doesn't really mean that much for them. So by balancing all these different elements, they can design a whole dinner set for that. So this is one of the a breakfast which uh, you have a jar of virus you pour it into the soil the previous night, and it will start to the water will start to make the soil to release a smell that's like uh, the smell of soil after the rain because it's kind of spore that the bacteria produce and the virus is also transgenic to the mushrooms and the plants to give them new flavors and new colors. The next day they come and harvest them using them for barbecuing but by barbecuing you also eat food and you produce poop and also become a host for the viruses. So the virus is also eat on yourself and then the whole thing circulate back to the whole system. So that's what we're trying to rethink about how would you design a different menu for that. So that's so far what I have with the cookbook. But the thing is um, because there is a lot of regulation with viruses and I really want to create a tangible experience for that. So I did a performance at the back society. Having them eating this dish. Uh, it's a rice, thin rice, uh, with a raw egg, but the egg whites are white, so it's like foamy. And on top you have sprinkle of uh, onions and soy sauce. It's actually a modified version of a Japanese dish. And what they do is that they're eating that dish while I was suggesting that they're eating uh, influenza viruses as an active ingredient in there and then suggesting so that uh, so you remember from the blind tasting yesterday I was asking how do you feel with your throat and I was giving them the direction that do you feel itchy and can you feel that the molecules of the virus is trying to enter the surface of your throat trying to combine with the membrane of your cell and then can you feel that like your body is starting to heat it up a bit? Like by hinting and suggesting that, so they can imagine that there are viruses in there. So I didn't tell them if there are viruses or not, but they experienced that. And in the end, a lot of people came and asked, like, were we really eating viruses? <laughs> Which I think it was really successful of that. I was just trying to use this fictional frame and um, to let them imagine and try to exper experience what the recipes in the cookbook will be. So that's what we're going to try to do today, but with the fermented food. Uh, I think it would be nice that we uh, spread to like how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So maybe we'll have a population of three groups. You can have like around four, 
And split to that if you have different cultural backgrounds. And you can choose like one to many, or I, I think it would be nice to have like two or three different fermented foods. And then you can design a dish. But the best part would be checking what are the microbes the fermented food is consists of and trying to find how they look like under the microscope. So you have an idea of what's the shape of it, how would it come into contact with your physics, uh, physicality. And then look into what kind of chemical it will produce and what's the interaction of it that we already know with the body. And then try to create a narrative of this process of eating into your body and what kind of things will happen using this technique of suggesting that is happening. And then design the dish. You can do a very simple cooking using the um, kitchen there. Or you can also just lay it out like cheese are usually served on the platters as well. But for all the people. And then we have a performance-ish uh, around four today.